for that introduction. Uh, I um, wanted to share uh, my thoughts about precision mental health. Three years ago, one month, one week, my significant other killed himself because of depression. He cared for people every day as an ER doctor, but he felt too stigmatized and too concerned that his seeking treatment would actually devastate his career, that he did not seek treatment. And here is a slide from the memorial. This is three years, one month, one week ago. This is uh, not something that is, unfortunately, an, a small statistic. He is one of many. So as many of you may know, at least one person dies from suicide every 40 seconds. And that is locally, nationally, and globally. The main cause of suicide is depression. Depression is also devastating our communities in terms of lost talent, lost productivity, and it's now the leading cause of disability. And many of us know that in terms of how it's affecting our students, how it's affecting our employers, families, ourselves. All of us are touched by this. My message today is that now is the time to bring mental health to a seat at the table of precision health. We need a data-driven approach, and I offer one such approach today, and that is transforming the model from the current focus on diagnostic categories that are very broad, they rely on observation, they don't rely on data, they, don't, they are not grounded in a model of how the biology actually functions, and yet we are making uh, life-impacting decisions. So I'll walk you through this uh, approach that we are developing here at Stanford and also with partners nationally and globally. We're inspired by the revolutions that you've heard about today and, and will hear about, and also by the opportunity to really accelerate this new model. If we think in some of our lifetimes, 1948 was a transformation in cardiac medicine, not long after, we have the transformation in cancer medicine, all because we gathered enough data to understand the biology and how it actually impacts life experience and symptoms, and therefore can develop new treatments and strategies. More recently, the same has been the case for HIV from 2002, and now it's the time to do this for mental health. In each case, it's been possible because we've identified the biology, the tissue, the virus, what is relevant, and then we can scale that to sensor technology or more remote uh, sensing. For mental health, I believe we need deep data as well as big data. We are not yet at the scale in terms of big data. That is the case for other areas of health. Yet there are certainly um, opportunities to scale this rapidly. And that is thanks to technology development that we can now look at the human brain in action, we can do it precisely, and arguably we can do it reproducibly. And that's something that's changed just in the last few years. That gives us the opportunity to understand the organ relevant to mental health, the brain, using brain scans and other non-invasive technologies looking at how that information is shaped by our genetics and then how is it expressed in terms of the symptoms that we experience and the behaviours that we express. And it's that last category that gives us a chance to actually have digital uh, sensing of the symptoms and the behaviours. But my argument is that we cannot do that in a meaningful way if we don't understand the biology. So how can we do this? With these kind of data, um, big and deep, we have the opportunity to transform the way we understand an illness such as depression. I present this as a prototype. If we can do this for depression, which is an urgent need, we have a prototype to do it for other illnesses, anxiety, autism, attention disorders. In this case, what we've been developing based on brain scans and then refined with genetics and other behavioural information is a set of what we call biotypes. And this is a new way to think about subtyping depression. And you can think about a couple of examples. So the one we call number one, which is the blue, the blue biotype, it is 
a set of regions in the brain that are connected when you're freely thinking and self-reflecting. And that is a very human function. We self-reflect all the time. If that becomes too connected, that gives you a feeling of ruminating and worrying. It's the feeling of when you wake up in the morning and you can't stop the thoughts, worrying about the future, how you're going to get through your list of to-dos. And that is a type of depression that does not respond to current treatments. We could think of also the one in purple by a type 4. It is a type that we see commonly in the research, but again, not responding to current treatments. And it is a different way that the brain becomes disrupted. It is a part of the brain that normally makes us feel motivated. We want to jump off the sofa to do something. It gives us a sense of enjoyment in food, in our activities. If that is underactive, we feel nothing. We feel flat. We find it extremely hard to motivate ourselves. And the rest of the brain has to overdo things to compensate. And that will make us feel exhausted. The others are other ways that you can generate different forms of depression, anxiety. And this is relevant in that the broad categories assume that are one size fits all. It would be like saying, if I say you have cancer, that is enough information to decide how to treat it. In this case, we can see there are many, many variations in depression that we need to think of similarly to cancer subtypes. So we can think of a variation in terms of brain circuits and then uh, genetics similarly to types of cancer within a diagnosis and then a subcategory, and similarly in terms of cardiac medicine, where you have different types that inform different interventions. To do this, we need reproducible metrics. We're talking about a really complex organ here, but we have achieved this in other areas. We can reproducibly acquire an EKG and EEG and many other technologies we have not yet done this for mental health. What we are developing is a way to do this. So we take these circuits, we, we acquire enough data to say what is reproducible from person to person, time to time. And then we quantify them using the activation and connections of the brain, which is the second row. And then the third row is calculating metrics, formulas that we can reproduce and eventually enable us to link these with other forms of data. So, for example, we could go even deeper, and this is another set of projects we have underway. If we have those reproducible metrics, we can then use sensors in more natural settings that are more temporally granular to actually link them back to the brain types and ultimately think about proxies that you could use in the real world the same way that we do for other areas of health. What is obviously really important and was highlight, but highlighted by the last speaker is how do we think about the individual person in this? They want a treatment. They want to get better. So we have some exciting results that show we can do this using these metrics and these types. Currently, the current chance of getting well with the first intervention you try for depression is about 30%. We can get that up to 75 to 81% accuracy if we consider the biotype. So the blue one will say, do you have a general capacity to respond to antidepressants or not? The orange one is more specific. It's a particular type of antidepressant and it's affected by your experience of stress versus resilience. The purple one that I talked about before, we have found is responding to a novel intervention that's currently off-label. And then this uh, red one, which is an effect on your attention and cognition, predicts non-response non-response to antidepressants, but there's one subtype, subtype of a subtype that we can rescue if we know about the genetics. From that, we have the opportunity to think about new clinical solutions. We've been piloting this in a grassroots uh, lab to clinic project where we actually gather this information, 
generate a report and deliver it to the residents and attendings. But we'd like to think about how can you move this to scale. You could imagine of the future where you have some form of smartphone that tells you how blue are you, how far into the blue biotype range are you. Of course, we need um, very efficient, scalable, deployable data science pipelines for this purpose. We have them in other areas of health. My call to action is we need them for mental health. And then we can envision the kind of studies that we're excited about in other areas of health, on scale, population-wide, and longitudinal. And that um, is our current initiative. We're very excited that we have a Centre for Precision Mental Health and Wellness recently launched here at Stanford, and I look forward to the opportunity to work with you in the room and others nationally and globally on realising this vision. Thank you.